can use a computer for free in Chicago and a place where we're tr uh, trying to build a community of uh, shared, a culture of shared learning. Um, public computer centers and community technology centers are the lifeblood of uh, access, skills, and data here in Chicago. Um, and I know that many of you provide, do this work, and it's amazing work that you all do. Um, in our last meetup, we were talking about what we might, uh, what might be a good topic, and um, we thought, like, you know, hey, just people getting up and saying what they're doing uh, and uh, what their needs are. So, like, what do you have to offer, and what what do you need from uh, other organizations? Um, we are live streaming this uh, meeting. And we have live meeting notes. And I want to encourage you uh, and anybody who's online who does computer, uh, um, uh, public computer centers and things along those lines that this is not about this room. It's not about this moment. Um, uh, it is about having an amazing lunch that everybody else is missing, which is terrible. Um, <laughs> but that's your problem, not ours. Um, and. Um, that you know we can work in an asynchronous fashion to help each other out. So hopefully this will spark all sorts of uh, connections, um, and uh, maybe uh, we should go around and introduce ourselves and, and what we're up to. So I'm Dan O'Neill. I run the Smart Chicago Collaborative, which is a civic organization devoted to improving lives in Chicago through technology. I work here at this joint, the Chicago Community Trust, and. Um, uh, we helped start this Connect Chicago thing along with the city um, in order to do what we uh, just that to create a culture of sharing. So that's me. Hi everyone, I'm Sonia Mariano. I work at Smart Chicago as well. And thank you, Mito. Greg Sun with Tech Services, and uh, I think we've met mo most everybody that's that's physically here uh, uh, before, and, and we have uh, had a role for a number of years in in helping to design and build and, and support and, and do training in a number of uh, community technology centers and partnered with the, the chamber and the, the community uh, trust group through uh, Smart Chicago on the, um, the BTOP uh, effort uh, uh, in the, over the last uh, two, three years and, and uh, look forward to talking about collaboration here today. Peggy Liz with Chicago Land Chamber of Commerce. Um, I do the education and, and workforce uh, initiatives for the, the chamber, and as Greg said, we worked on the uh, digital skills of initiative. And um, the chamber doesn't have a, a direct connection anymore with public computing centers, but we expect uh, something to be evolving because the uh, Chicago Public Libraries is looking at how they can be more supportive of the job seekers and workforce initiative in, in the city. Um, I'm Ray Nieto. I'm also with Tech Services, a program manager uh, responsible for delivering workforce uh, development and training, training programs with uh, different initiatives going on. I'm LaShawn Anthony. I'm a small business consultant. I provide design, promotion, and fundraising support for business owners and nonprofits. Uh, I'm David Swanson. I'm with Erie Neighborhood House. I'm the Assistant Director of Workforce. Uh, I've uh, been teaching a manufacturing bridge training program, but our workforce development department also encompasses the technology services, uh, the training classes for basic, intermediate, and advanced uh, computing skills. So we have a community technology center uh, integrated into our site as well. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Julian Masalde. I am the director for workforce development programs at our neighborhood house. And I work with David, obviously, on all the great stuff he just mentioned. And I'm Christopher Whitaker. I'm a consultant with Smart Chicago, and I help administer the Connect Chicago website. Awesome. So who, what do we got? Tech services, mm -hmm. huh? Why not? All right. Dan gave us five slides, and uh, uh, we boiled all of ours down to three. I hope that's acceptable, wow. Dan. And, and the first you one doesn't succinct. count. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just sit uh, uh, here and, since we're a smaller group and, and uh, just make it more informal. But uh, yeah, tech services, uh, uh, is, as we move to the, the next slide, whoever's uh, controlling it there, uh, 
Um, the, the who we are uh, is um, we're an organization uh, that has, has worked hard in, in the region here and within the state of Illinois to uh, design and, and implement and, and help support uh, digital uh, uh, literacy as well as basic uh, literacy programs uh, uh, around the state. Uh, as well as uh, working within communities to help them uh, implement and support uh, technology, whether that's through a, a, a public computing center or a, a community technology center. Um, uh, ed, ed, we have uh, partnered, again, with uh, uh, the Chamber uh, through Peggy Luce over a number of years uh, now. Um, 15 years, I guess it's, it's, it's been <laughs> uh, in, in designing education uh, programs, uh, uh, again, delivered in school or, or out of school, as well as workforce development programs for uh, dislocated workers or even incumbent workers that uh, maybe need to be reskilled to retain their employment or to advance in, the, in their employment. And we do uh, as well uh, work in, in uh, the enterprise area in, in designing and in, uh, implementing and supporting uh, various uh, systems, whether those are application-based or network security uh, and, and so forth. And, and we are uh, active in community and economic development uh, as well, looking within uh, neighborhoods or, or uh, larger geographic areas to uh, uh, help promote uh, uh, job opportunities, uh, uh, new business development, entrepreneurship, uh, in, in, and so forth, and uh, working with uh, various state agencies uh, um, and, and local uh, agencies as, as well. So that's a, a synopsis of, of who we are and what we do. Um, based on, on our experience, and, and I'm, I'm going to talk uh, uh, on the next slide about where we see uh, opportunities for collaboration. Um, uh, while we do an awful lot, and there's there's needs and things that, that we have as, as an organization, uh, we see the biggest opportunities for collaboration based on our observations, it, it, collaboration on, on how do we leverage technology more in in the environments that, that we work in. And, and uh, one of the biggest things that, that uh, we see is, is standardizing goals and, and metrics. When we talk about digital literacy, for example, that means something different to everybody that, that you talk to. And then, how do you, uh, uh, you know, how do you achieve digital literacy? Again, that means something different to uh, just about everybody that, that you talk to. And so, it's really hard to um, uh, sustain uh, uh, these types of, of efforts when you don't have standards that everyone is working towards. And it's hard to fund uh, on a broader scale uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, uh, when we don't have standards that we're all working towards. And that doesn't mean that everybody does 100% exactly the same thing, but at least though those core metrics that, that we're working towards, those core goals, if we can standardize those, uh, I think uh, we can see a lot more sustainability of a, of a lot of things that kind of start and stop. Um, uh, you know, when uh, the, the uh, Broadband Technology Opportunities Program funding ran out, 99% of the activities stopped because there wasn't really any common sustainability that, that had been built in uh, uh, being fueled by uh, standard uh, metrics and, and goals. Uh, so I, I, we see an opportunity to collaborate on standardization. What are we trying to achieve together and how are we going about measuring that and then how do we sustain that, whether that's through funding or uh, through uh, uh, other programmatic uh, efforts. Uh, one of the other things that, that we see is, is reliable uh, technology support for community-based organization. Um, most uh, organizations uh, survive day-to-day -day, uh, because they're very lucky. Um, Ray and I visited earlier this week a, an organization that has, has been um, living off of, of an environment that I don't know if you've ever seen um, some of the uh, wiring within some of the cities in, in uh, India. And no, no, uh, uh, you, you know, no animosity towards <laughs> what they're doing in India. But if you've ever seen how everything is spaghetti cable between buildings and along the roadways and everything, uh, this this organization, uh, that's how they were cabled. And, and it, if a problem happened, it would take the guy responsible for figuring it out all day to solve one little issue. And um, uh, and that's not because he wasn't working hard. <laughs> It's because he really didn't know how to even clean that up. Um, uh, he didn't know how to, to, to plan things out to segment networks so that he didn't have to buy a whole new internet connectivity for a, 
uh, a functionality within the organization. They wanted accounting split off from everybody else, so their solution was, okay, you have to have a totally separate network, and now you have those costs, you have the support issues, and, and so forth. So reliable technology uh, uh, support uh, uh, as a standard across C CBOs, we see uh, an opportunity for uh, cost savings, we see an opportunity for being able to leverage more technology. Again, we see many uh, CBOs who really can't afford to invest in the technology they need, but if they were to partner with other similar CBOs, uh, uh, they could access uh, the technology, pool their resources, access the technology that they, they need, whether that's in combined licensing or whether that's in um, uh, co-locating within a data center. Uh, it's saving costs, uh, saving, you know, getting good enterprise level support. Uh, we see uh, uh, many uh, uh, CBOs that uh, have a database, what they call their database, which is a distributed uh, set of spreadsheets across any number of uh, workstations with versions that no one knows which is the correct version and someone comes in and overwrites uh, someone else's changes because they they don't know uh, which version is the live version and, and there's no uh, real database controls. Um, being able, there's a lot of uh, hard work that is done because a lot of the, the CBO staff don't know how to use technology uh, effectively or they don't know what's available. We just talked to an organization that was said, boy, we'd really like to get to census data, Dan. And oh, we go, yeah. oh, yeah, guess what? There's a meetup coming up yeah. <laughs> just about uh, you know, census data and, and how, to, how to map that. It, it, and they don't know that those things are readily available to them. Um, so we, we really see a, a great opportunity here in Chicago uh, to, to put in uh, a real uh, uh, enterprise level type of support across CBOs and make that available uh, to them so that um, they're not just talking to their, their local support who knows what they know, but they don't know what they should know. And, and again, we, uh, Ray and I were at an or organization uh, earlier this week uh, as well, and, and you, we ask how much bandwidth or, or, you know, do you have within you know, coming into your organization, and they said, well, we're running on a 100 megabit. Well, okay, that's, that's nice, but the real question is what? Is it about his local bandwidth or is it about his internet bandwidth is, you know, broadband is what we were talking about. And, and then we say, okay, you've got AT&T, right? What's the bandwidth we're getting? And he, he doesn't know. He, he doesn't know how to in, interpret it. And that's not a bad thing, you know, if he, if he doesn't need to know. But at that point in time, we needed to know in order to, to provide him with good recommendations. And, uh, uh, folks don't know. Uh, we were at an organization who was looking to upgrade their technology and their solution was to buy new motherboard, new hard drives, new RAM, new power supplies and put it all in the shell of what they existed and they would save the cost. They would, they, they would save costs. Well, when you added all those costs up, it was more than what it would cost to buy brand new and have the warranty of, of a brand new uh, device and, and uh, not have the effort of, uh, you know, have the cost savings in time as well uh, in, in not having to uh, build the, the, those units. Uh, and again, that it wasn't that that was a bad idea, it's just that they didn't know how to really compare uh, at costs and, and how to look at, um, you know, reliability and sustainability. Um, uh, the uh, third bullet point that we have in, in opportunities for collaboration is, is the real integration of community workforce and economic development. There's a lot of talk about how that is, is integrated, but when you actually um, uh, get out and work in it, uh, they are separate uh, uh, areas of, of effort and a lot of duplicity, a lot of things that are going on in community development that uh, are also going on in economic development, but in, in the exact same block <laughs> of the city, but they're not working cooperatively. Same thing with workforce development. Uh, a lot of economic development that's going on that doesn't have workforce development uh, setting alongside of it to, if we're looking to attract certain businesses, are we preparing the workforce within those communities to take those jobs uh, on? Uh, there's a uh, here in the near west side, there's a, a very large um, uh, uh, organization that, that's uh, uh, going to be starting up there. Uh, um, 
uh, dealing in, in uh, uh, produce distribution. And they're having to look outside of the community to bring workers in because uh, the workers in, in the area don't have the, the skills. Uh, so instead of working with workforce development uh, to, to uh, uh, provide a solution for those folks uh, there, they're, they're pulling people in from outside. That's, that's more effort on their part from a recruiting standpoint. Um, and it, it's not supporting the, the local community. So we, we see an opportunity uh, for collaboration across those three areas and, and really uh, pull them together and, and uh, end up with, with larger uh, results. Capacity development is, is the last thing that we put up uh, here. Uh, many uh, uh, organizations that we've worked with are, are working at their capacity, um, and, and a lot of them are working to keep the lights on. Um, they, they come in every day to, to get the, the work done, to get the, the funding, uh, you know, to fulfill the funding that they have in front of them, and no one's looking at what happens when that program <laughs> uh, ends. And, and uh, there's, we see a need for uh, capacity development to, to help folks look beyond today's uh, workload and, and effort, um, whether that's in board development, whether that's in uh, 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 good business processes uh, within, within their environment. That could be uh, uh, you know, funding development uh, uh, as well. And, and it's also uh, training of, of staff. Uh, again, whether that's in technology or, or in good business practices uh, there so that uh, within the region here, we can actually do more without, um, uh, without having to uh, tax the current capacity that, that, that we have. So those are the, the four areas of opportunities for collaboration that, that we see, and, and uh, uh, we'd be uh, certainly happy after, you know, after we get to the end of the conversation here to, to talk more to those. Hopefully. Awesome. Well, it's only three slides. Yeah, for those who came in, um, maybe say, well, hey, what's up? But, uh, where are you from? And, and, and I'm Stephen from Association House. I'm the technology coordinator. Yeah. It's my colleague, uh, EJ Wilder, who's our newest. Uh, Employees will be charged with our customer service training, so new workforce development training. Yeah. Okay, yeah. All right. Oh, me, um, Jane Helgi Bear from the Department of Innovation and Technology at the City of Chicago. <coughs> oh, would I get food? Sorry, I'm a little And then Laura? Oh, wow. Laura Lane, um, Regional e team Leader for Partnership for Connected Illinois. All right. So who, and by the way, these slides, we have them available, right? So there are humans can see this on the internet? Um, Where are they at? The, as people are talking, I'm showing. Oh, OK. And then we'll publish them as well. Is that all right with everybody? Then we just put them up? OK. All right, who we got next? Wait, well, who's next? Just pull up any of them. Uh, any, 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 There you go. Well, Sean. That's the presentation, though. That's not your show. It's not the one? <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, Sean Anthony, go right ahead. So, um, on this slide. So I am a small business consultant. Uh, happy to be here. It goes to the next slide. Here you go. Oh. I'll just scroll down. However, the 
So I was fortunate in um, 2012 to be one of the top five percent most used profiles on LinkedIn. Um, in addition to the services that I provide, which are website management, graphic design, um, e-commerce solutions, email marketing, and as I mentioned before, fundraising support for nonprofits. I also mentor small business owners and teams. And I have a number of business partnerships with various centers in order to be able to, to service the clients. You know what? I'm a drag boy. How's that sound? So anyway, the next slide um, was just detailing the various services that I offer, um, which, as I mentioned, is website management, e-commerce solutions, email marketing, graphic design. Uh, fundraising support. There you go. Yeah. I also write content uh, for the web, uh, for email campaigns. Okay. And provide um, social media management for clients so that they can um, promote their businesses on the internet through their social networks. Awesome. I wanted to mention a couple of events that are coming up. Uh, if you happen to know uh, some nonprofits that do not have a website, Google is hosting a week-long event beginning on the 24th, which is Get Your Business Online. Each day they are having specific speakers, and uh, each day will focus on a particular topic. So one day they're going to be talking about how to better promote your business online. On Wednesday, the 26th, they're going to talk about um, how to develop a website through their Google site. Thursday's topic is um, promoting your business through their various Google ads. And then on Friday, um, Ms. Emerson is going to be speaking. I think it's Melissa Emerson. She's a small biz lady. And then someone else is speaking on Monday. But if anyone is interested in the, um, the link, you know, let me know and I can send you the link of the various organizations that will be hosting these live webinars. Um, and afterwards, you know, of course, um, at the various organizations, there may be some assistance to help business owners and nonprofit managers with their various questions. On the 25th, 26th, and 29th, I'm hosting office hours after the live streams um, to assist individuals who have questions. For women business owners, on the 27th, there's a fantastic event. This is their second annual event, which will be at uh, UIC at 725 West Roosevelt from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. There will be many um, exhibitors, uh, fantastic information being shared. There will also be on-site um, counseling that will be available to business owners who have questions that I recommend it absolutely. Uh, I attended last year and it was fantastic. Unfortunately, you know, unlike what the slide says, I will not be an exhibitor because I had too much going on and was not able to submit my information in time, but I will be there uh, for a period of hours. And then lastly, you can find me on the internet under Visuals for You. That's my username pretty much everywhere. Um, and my contact information. Uh, it was last month's meetup where I shared that I was interested in partnering and collaborating 
with some of the good folks here. If there were any opportunities, and I'm thrilled that Daniel turned those words into this meetup. And so, um, you know, if there are opportunities in the future, you know, I certainly hope to speak with any of you. Wonderful. All right. How about Erie Tech? Erie Neighborhood House. Let me, let me go over here. Let me finish it. Um, Fugian and I, and my name is David Swanson, and this is Fugian Rosade. Uh, we are from Erie House. Uh, Erie House is actually a, a fairly large social service uh, agency. Um, we're a CBO. We've been around since uh, 1870, quite a while, over 140 years. and. And uh, workforce and technology is really only a small part of what we do. Uh, I was saying to LaShawn before, uh, most of what we do is actually child care, and uh, we do a variety of other services for uh, immigrant communities in particular. But uh, we've had uh, technology programming for uh, decades. I don't know the start date of that, but at least as long as I've been there. And uh, we've always offered uh, our technology classes, uh, digital literacy type stuff, in uh, English and Spanish. Uh, we serve a large Spanish-speaking community. And uh, the tech classes uh, in all of our adult programming, uh, it actually serves the greatest number of people. We serve uh, you know, several hundred people per year. I think it's actually, uh, it gets into the thousands. I think it's, we serve nearly a thousand people a year if you count the people that actually come through the CTC. Uh, we have a uh, community uh, technology center in West Town. And then uh, also in Little Village, we have a site in uh, the Little Village neighborhood of Chicago on the south side. And uh, right now, uh, although we do, uh, we, we put a lot of people through our basic and our intermediate and what we call our advanced technology classes, uh, people are very happy with the programs, but they just want to take more classes. And we are looking for ways to translate that into actual economic development or uh, workforce uh, outcomes like job placement and stuff like that. Uh, for funding purposes, but also just for the good of the community members, we want to make sure that we're giving them something that they can take somewhere and uh, we'll open up doors for them in their life. So uh, I was uh, really uh, glad to hear uh, what you guys at Tech Services were saying uh, about uh, trying to strive for standardized goals and metrics across organizations. Uh, that's kind of what I would like to find out uh, from this group, how we can uh, how we can agree or at least uh, share what we're doing and what will be uh, the best the best goals to strive for uh, so that we can actually uh, we can actually deliver to our participants something that's going to be of use to them, you know, not just something that makes them feel good. Well, they do, they do feel very good after they take our classes. We do graduations and everything. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't know, I want to pass the ball to Leon um, so we can just kind of alternate slides here. But, yeah, well, so. I mean, I think it, it's sort of jumping around a bit. Yeah, um, but, yeah. Uh, but no, I mean, I, I think that they you know, obviously did a good job talking about what, what we're looking to do with um, Specifically to the CTC, the CTCs, as David mentioned, but I was just wanted to kind of circle back a little bit more towards the the, the larger uh, purpose and goal of, of the organization, uh, because I think that's really uh, important. And I think it speaks to the fact that you know, the organization has been around since the late 1870s and has become a, one of the most well-known uh, community organizations in the city, starting out as, as a settlement house originally. And now, um, as David mentioned, now we have expanded uh, a lot of our a lot of our organizational time and effort is dedicated towards uh, towards childcare programs. Um, but through those programs, we did find out that people were looking for more, uh, not just for the actual child care, but the, what what were the parents up to? You? What what did the parents need? So it was through that that sort of a, a, a esteem that we figured out that we could provide um, such such programs for parents. Um, and you know, we have uh, lots of community-based organizations as partners as well, one of them being Association House that we work with um, a lot, and we hope to continue that moving forward, and we think that we will. And um, yeah, I mean, I just kind of want, I, I think David did a great job, so I don't want to repeat myself too much, but uh, in terms of what we uh, what we need, you know, we, we wanted to talk about that a little bit because we are actively looking for um, some of these partnerships, again, in tech services uh, was talking about. So, um, uh, 
specific image of software, you know, something as, as, as basic as that, that, but that changes relatively frequently, uh, is important for, for our participants, and it's important for, uh, uh, it's important to ensure that not only are we meeting uh, our, our own internal uh, goals as, as an organization, but that we're providing our participants with uh, the necessary skills you know, so that we're not offering someone office, you know, 2007, but that we can keep that up. And unfortunately, there are situations where there are community-based organizations where you go in and a lot of their equipment, you know, when they offer these sorts of services, as you say, they sort of have wires everywhere and, you know, fairly outdated equipment. And as, 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 a, as a beginning, that is great, but we want to make sure that we are preparing uh, our program participants for what is going on now uh, for, the, for the jobs that are available now, but also for the jobs that we know are coming down the pipeline, especially with the uh, with the big announcement from uh, Obama administration recently about workforce development uh, becoming you know having a hub here in Chicago uh, moving forward. It's 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 exciting for us uh, because we know that we are on the cusp of that um, as a relatively small community-based organization. Uh, but we want to make sure that we are um, we are working with our with our participants as much as possible to uh, provide them with whatever, whatever they need to get them to those jobs that we know are here, but the ones that are also coming. Yeah, I mean, um, that pretty much says it. <clears throat> um, Julian and I both represent the Workforce Development Department. There, within that, there's a technology services program, and that is all of the computer uh, classes that we offer within that technology services program. So these needs listed up here are coming from our Technology Services Coordinator. Um, he is the one who's actually in touch with the physical needs of the program. So uh, uh, I see, you know, those are those are kind of the obvious needs. I would say of any any trainer, and uh, they certainly are our needs. Uh, but then there is also the community's need uh, that I want to mention. Uh, the community is is uh, coming to us, you know, very interested in these computer classes. It's a really easy sell. Uh, they know by word of mouth that we have these, and it's not really on people's mind necessarily. Uh, what can I do with this? Uh, or, uh, you know, we're we're looking at implementing the A plus certification uh, because that's just you know something that that we feel might be able to get them uh, uh, some kind of career advancement once they graduate with us. But people coming to us uh, so far have been more likely to start. Uh, internet cafes, even if they go back to their home countries, you know, that happens a lot. Or people will uh, kind of go off uh, and do small businesses They'll um, of their own. They'll do computer repair, or they'll do uh, kind of side jobs. They'll turn it into a side job. And that's kind of been the extent of our workforce development in the technology services realm. We really like to expand that and get into more, uh, show people some pathways into IT you know, professions. So that's kind of, that's our vision right now. <clears throat> Let me pick up on a couple of things you said. First of all, the I mean, you guys work in the workforce development section of the Erie House um, mission, and it Greg it ties in pretty closely to, to one of your sort of you know broad I ideas and, and needs is to, to more tightly integrate workforce development and computer skills and digital literacy. It's something, Danielle, I know that you think about a lot at the city, um, and we're all trying to think about at, at as we, you know, we uh, as as Danielle implement this the tech plan, the city's tech plan, um, because uh, there isn't really a real connection, and frankly, there's there's a lack of connection between the digital. I mean, you guys are a great example of a technology operation inside. Another organization that does that does direct human human services, but then those direct human services interact with workforce development things along those lines. I think that the general sphere of workforce development is a little more mature in terms of you know funding, in terms of being a um, a, a discipline in and of itself, and it's something that over the last maybe decade or so has been something that's turned into a real discipline. And I think that's one of the one of our goals around Connect Chicago and just pulling everybody together is to create that uh, that discipline. And when I talk about that discipline as a culture of shared learning, we also have an opportunity to blow past old models of 
direct government funding directly to you know to an institution that delivers services. But I mean, I'm very compelled by the idea that people you train go back to another to a country of origin and start businesses like internet cafes. Um, that's it. That's that's what we need here. That's what we need. This is where where it's at. We have to get to the point where we understand that all of these things that we're doing are actually enormously valuable in the marketplace, and that there is a marketplace for these for these activities, whether it's you know the provision of of computing or the all the things that you can do on it. Um, I had a specific question about Photoshop. What is your what what are your Photoshop classes look like right now? What is what happened? What's the deal? Um, as far as Photoshop, um, that is, it's, it, it begins in our, at our intermediate level, and uh, you know, I'm not in charge of that department, so I'm going to give you the best idea that I have of it. But uh, uh, all of our students have to go through the basic digital literacy curriculum. There's no starting halfway, and after they graduate that, uh, the Photoshop is. It's one of the topics. I think it's one of uh, uh, you know, along with the basic office software. Uh, the Photoshop is it's taught from an image processing standpoint related to uh, modifying photographs. We usually have people make like uh, family photograph albums or stuff that they would actually want to do with image processing, mm -hmm. and they work on their projects. Uh, and they we. We, we've always wanted to have a, a dedicated server so that we can display people's personal websites that they make, um, but we haven't we haven't actually done that yet. Um, but people do uh, they work with a photographer, one of our one of our tech promoters, who is uh, uh, himself a graduate of the program, so I call him tech promoters. He's also a professional photographer, and he's uh, someone who comes in with all the lighting equipment and shows people how to uh, you know. Do professional level image processing on their photos, so that's kind of what our Photoshop class is like right now. Huh. Yeah. Um, let me think about two ideas. So one is um, that city colleges have this ability to enable any space to be a community classroom. It just has to be designated by the local community college. And so that classroom can then be used for earning credit towards the social degree. Um, so give that some thought about partnering up. And, and maybe colleges do this too. I just know about the city colleges. Yeah, that's but, interesting. Right, because I was trying to get a space in my community designated as community classroom because we were having people just have problems taking the bus down the street because you know, of boundaries that we all know about. Um, so give that some thought. Um, to, to help with the next step with some of your clients. And then the second thing is what I was um, sitting through this presentation um, of a robotics um, plant that wanted to relocate in one of the areas we were targeting. Um, one, one of the presenters um, says, you know, they're not looking for all that type of education, just do you have the certificate? So with the digital ma manufacturing lab coming and more things like that, like the group we're talking to, just figure out what those the five certificates are <laughs> that you wanna, you know, go to, and you'll and, and that is a potential source of, of funding um, because she was going through. This is the engineer who knew how to do all the stuff, and she said, and and it was a real workforce opportunity. She was modeling it off of I think a group out of Ohio. That takes folks who are re-entering the community for whatever reasons, whether it's mothers re-entering the workforce, whether it's um, people who are formerly incarcerated re-entering, and turning them into folks who can work in this robotics plant. Um, and as long as we could get them to this level of math, I get this certificate, you know, and we can work on the soft skills, you know, they were great. So, um, so just figure out what those four certificates are. <laughs> So those four certificates? Well, I, I have are, no idea. I'm not a robotics okay. engineer. Um, mm -hmm. I have notes somewhere. But but all of that type of light manufacturing is coming back. That's why yeah. the digital manufacturing lab is here, because it's it's coming back. And so there's lots of corridors um, in all of our communities that can be used for that type of um, local business um, initiatives and then for the light manufacturing. Um, so that's another area of certification. Um, to consider. Now I don't know what all that takes. I have, you know, like I said, I'm ideas. 
Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Yeah, that's great. I mean, we do. I, you know, I'm concerned with the manufacturing work, um, machining and fabrication. You know, it's a part of the workforce department, but mm -hmm. there is, we, of course, we do want to integrate our technology classes with that too. So. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's why I said since you, yeah, that's right. what made me think about it. Right. right. Thank you. you mentioned you have tech promoters. Can that's you talk right. a little bit about that role? What that role is in um, sure, I would give it a shot. Um, the Tech Motors program is, uh, again, uh, you referenced uh, uh, our sort of lead on the, on the IT part at this point within the theory in the house and maybe Ed Box said in the street before she couldn't be here today. But um, Ed Box is great. She, her role is essentially to, she trains, um, she first goes out and recruits, right? So all of us, uh, it's all coming out, all of us have to try to recruit our programs. but. Through that, we find folks that are interested in, um, in these sorts of uh, um, classes that are being offered, particularly the I our IT, a burgeoning IT bridge. And um, and through that, eventually, we get some folks that will go through the through the cohort, through the, through the program, and then continue on, you know, in, in some fashion, um, either within the church or within uh, starting up uh, businesses of, of, of any sort. But Edva tends to work with, um, she starts to work with folks that want to continue on with theory as volunteers in particular and she then trains those folks in terms of how to go from being a participant of the group to being a trainer of this new cohort that's coming behind them. So the idea being that it's supposed to be a self-sustaining sort of self-perpetuating model, you know, and because that involves only one person um, and obviously she can only go so far. So we want to make sure that, there's, that we have as wide a bridge as possible. It's also not just wide but deep um, with, with people that are uh, engaged uh, um, and they decide their level of engagement you know some folks can only be there perhaps once a week some people really sink their teeth into it um, and can, can be a little bit more service or uh, provide a little bit more of the service to Yuri and to Edva in particular um, and then through that we have you know the presence of a tech promoter um, helps Yuri in any number of ways right not just particularly within the specific programs that, that they're working on but even just coming in and seeing um, for folks that are interested in Yuri to bring perhaps their child there, to see that someone is really taking another step forward, not just in terms of receiving a service, but now giving back into that service. Uh, the, the, the tech promoter program is, is really, uh, it's a great idea, but it is uh, costly in terms of time because uh, it, it takes obviously a lot of time to, to train, to recruit and then train. Um, but the, the, the output that we're getting um, uh, for, at least from the perspective of Yuri, uh, seems to be great, and obviously for the for the for the tech promoters themselves is also something that um, we've heard nothing but good things about this far. You know, is that something that is a, is a skill building uh, uh, pipeline, but it's also uh, even just a, 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 in terms of more of the soft skills, you know, in terms of people who maybe are a little a little more reticent, but uh, are are good with technology, and then they are eventually forced to really deal with folks on on a on a face to face. Uh, basis in order to get them to a level that hopefully that they are at, if not farther. Oh yeah, um, I also wanted I wanted to mention that our, our tech promoters program, which uh, it, like Leon said, it just kind of it turns uh, participants who've been taking all of our classes into the people that actually modify the curriculum and run the classes. Uh, that's really heavily based in a popular education model. Um, that's something that comes out of Latin America. Um, it's just a model. It, I don't. It's hard for me to explain it, but if you look it up, it's called educación popular. It's a popular education is like is like a way of of creating an atmosphere in which uh, all of the students kind of respect each other, and any one of them could become the leader, or the teacher of the group um, at any point. Um, so that's really the model that has has supported the tech promoters. Um, without that philosophy, I don't, I don't think it would have been possible for a tech program to actually survive and be self-sustaining and be producing its own teachers and modifying its own curriculum without that that underpinning. You know, so edu popular education. <laughs> I, I'm not going to go into it right now, though. It's, it's too much. But. Well, that's really interesting. I'd be uh, interested too. How long do they tend to stay with you guys? And, and uh, what kind of outcomes do they have? Do you see them get new, well, new and better jobs? or We, we see people get jobs, but um, we have people stay with us in the long term. Um, most people who complete our basic class, if they 
if they continue with us after the basic class, they take every single other class that we offer, and they just want to take them all. And that takes a year. It takes a couple of years. Um, and we've been uh, we've had the same group of tech promoters for a long time. Um, there's very little turnover, and we are able to give them a stipend out of the funding that we get. Yeah. Um, it's a stipend. It's not yeah. much, but it's something. Um, as far as outcomes, workforce outcomes, we haven't been documenting. You know, we haven't been accountable for it to our funders, yeah. and I don't think that they. I, I think that most people who've been staying in our program for a while have a stable situation at home. You know, and they're fine. Uh, and I would not say that they've been. You know, we, we haven't been catapulting them into the IT realm, and they're. You know, it, that those kind of outcomes haven't been happening. It's been more along the lines of returning home um, to their country and starting their activities, or consulting on the side, making extra money that way, but it's probably under the table anyway. You know, so it's like, we just haven't been documenting that. Um, what about quality of life outcomes for them, too? Because there's so much more they can do for other areas of their life once they have these other skills. Yeah, that's, well, that's the best part of it. That's, if you walk into our, our tech lab, that's what you see is just pictures of people's families, and, and the kind of projects that they do is really kind of geared towards well, they're the ones that came up with the curriculum. So what you see is people, you see a lot of, of people's personal lives um, being involved with the, the tech classes. That's that's why they want to use the technology. It's not, um, you know, it's not that they're trying to accomplish A, B, and C so they can do this, but they just want to enrich their lives through technology. So um, now our challenge is to make that compatible with the workforce, <laughs> with workforce outcomes. So that's, that's what we're really trying to do. But yeah, we have to build a culture. Oh, the culture is there. Yeah, I can so, say. I mean, yeah, so the program is very strong in, in terms of yeah, the uh, culture that's been developed. But go for the outcomes now. <laughs> um, one actual question about the Photoshop is the goal. So it sounds great. Two things. The sort of like the basis in family photos. The basis in being of use to the people being trained is great. Do you have any course material at all for it? Because that'd be awesome to publish that. Well, yeah, actually, uh, we do. I mean, the, the curriculums uh, are they're pretty well established. And uh, I'm going to have to ask our coordinator about that, because she, uh, she's the steward of those, <laughs> of those documents. But, uh, but yeah, I can imagine her saying, yeah, she would be happy to. Uh, I would imagine her sharing those, that at least what the curriculum consists of, if not the whole thing. And, and you guys can put that on your Connect Chicago page, your detail page on Connect Chicago. Oh, okay. Okay, um, sure. Because then anybody who's interested in these topics could then grab it. Okay, sure. And what's your specific interest in the Photoshop? Well, I'm just drilling down on it because you have oh, okay. it, right? So oh, it's okay. like, in our world, we, we want to drill down into tools. So there's the big picture, and I think Greg you just did a really good job of sort of laying out, like, what's the big picture? What sphere are we in? What, you know, what are the resources we have? And you guys are drilling down. I've heard, like, so that's sort of like a benchmark, almost, you can think of, right? It's like, we should have, you know, uh, a region that construes technology education and stuff in this manner. And then you guys are drilling down into Educación Popular. You know, that's like, that's, an, I mean, we could talk for three days right. about yeah. that, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and yeah, and then and then um, also, so on Photoshop, what we're trying to do in Connect Chicago is to lift up great examples and give concrete tools for other people who are less along the line. Right? So Erie House is a relatively sophisticated CTC when it comes to these things, right? When it comes to having a philosophy of education, when it comes to, you know, you have long parent experience in, in teaching Photoshop. And what I would love to see is, and this is why I'm hesitant, I'd love to talk to El, El, Elma, is that Elva. Elva, about it. Um, but, you know, it gets sophisticated because what I was going to suggest is maybe um, using GIMP. Right, which is a free photo editing tool that's available online. Um, 
But I wouldn't suggest using GIMP if one of the meth one of the objectives of the instruction is to teach him sophisticated software. You know what I mean? So it's right, like, right, right, right. I, it, but having that discussion is really what matters more than like, oh, you should do this or you should do that. It's more like, you know, wow, what is your goal? Well, my goal is to like get people to feel really comfortable with a really powerful enterprise grade piece of software that they can then use and they'll make, you know, a business. Or if the goal is you know, they want to crop out the ant that they can't stand, you know what I mean, so they can put the photo, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's all on a continuum. Um, anyway, it's a super, um, super instructive. Right? Anything else for these guys? You had some more slides? Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. That's what you need. Oh, what is A plus certification? I should know. Is that a thing? Um, he is. Okay. Yeah, we're looking at doing that. Um, we uh, there's a lower level of it. It's called Strata. That's IT fundamentals. Just really just oh, the really? most basic stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and our, our students uh, they all pass that exam very easily. But the actual A plus certification by CompTIA, we, we don't. We're not a testing center. We don't offer that training right now. So we're trying to um, amp up our capabilities to where we can you know, deliver that certification to the students. And I think that from a collaboration standpoint, I think those are the types of things that you know, we talk about. Because there are places that are testing centers, and you know, you, you know, maybe you want to build that for yourself, or you want to take advantage of the ones that, that might well, be near, near you and so forth. To, and, uh, yeah, um, you know, you, you talk about more advanced uh, equipment for uh, you know for those types of classes, and and uh, maybe until you build a volume where those uh, investments make sense might partner with someone that's already got that. And that then you get people to a certain level, maybe then they, they move to, to a partner that, that, that has already those investments. And sure. that would actually be ideal. I mean, for us, like, that, that's the big thing. When, you know, once you get beyond the desktop, keeping up with that is even harder. Because <laughs> then it becomes even more expensive. And, and it's not just you now the technology, it's it's also the, the, the training materials. And, and while you know, the, the popular education is good at a certain level. At some point, it, it, it's more structured and, and formalized, and, and you have to have someone that has done it before, and and, uh, um, and so forth. So again, from a collaboration standpoint, it might be good, uh, at least in the near term, to be looking for those partners that maybe uh, you have you have the folks, they have the means, and and and, and you share that. I agree, and we definitely are looking for those kind of partners. So any assistance. Um, right now, the only thing we've done as far as transferring people to a, a training partner for A plus is Humboldt Park Vocational Center at Wright College over there in Humboldt mm -hmm. Park. They have that program, and we've been transferring people over there. But their program isn't really fleshed out yet, and uh, we're wondering, hey, should we do it ourselves on site, or are there other partners we can work with? To you know, again, if we're at the collabor you know, talking about collaboration, um, you know, I, I probably even challenges uh, to why you can do this. You, you know, where are you going with it? You know, if there, there's there's a uh, you know there's a, a glow lot of people that have years of years of experience that. You, People coming out of a program where they have just the A plus, and I don't mean to minimize it, but if I just have it and none of the experience, now I'm up against those competing in a workforce. Now I'm not saying this is a bad idea. I'm just saying, what is that outcome going to be? Is it is it going to be frustration? Right. right. You know, that, hey, I've got this, but I can't do anything with it. Um, uh, or is there an outcome that that has maybe could be built for them, and so that there's a good trans transition weight, maybe it's you know some outlet of, of doing the popular education. And now I know more, maybe I can do more with, with training people. Or maybe uh, one of the things that, that we've seen effective is, is um, uh, creating a, a depot for repair, mostly virus, you know, taking care of viruses and stuff. But now, now then folks can, can start applying what, what they, they've uh, learned and get some experience. And, and working in the community to, to do technology support for the community. Now you're building up the community as, as well in their capabilities. Maybe they're putting in, you know, helping put in small uh, wireless networks in a home or, or uh, other types of, of uh, 
uh, taking what they've learned and applying them within the, in the community they may not be earning a, much of any <laughs> any dollars, but they're gaining the experience as, as well. I think that's the right question. Yeah, but that's a question we need to ask ourselves. Yeah. Well, and I, I just had a phone conversation, conversation this morning with the uh, exact title. I think the um, director for workforce development programs at, with CompTIA. Was Gretchen Cole, you know, we've had conversations in the past uh, with my predecessor, the person who had a position before I did, um, and she is looking, we're looking to have a sort of a sit down, sort of kind of start to flesh this out a little bit more because it was initially kind of discussed uh, a few weeks or a few months back, but never really went anywhere, um, along with the Chicago Workforce Board, you know, to sort of to really figure out right, whether it makes sense for us, but on top of that, as you said, you know, great question. Like, what are the options? Reggie, right, you talked to you about the IT learning exchange. We had today was our first conversation yeah. on the phone, so she threw a couple things at me, but uh, that wasn't one of them. I wanted to add in regard to Photoshop, uh, there were several outcomes that came to my mind in terms of what people can do with those skills, you know, after they've learned. The software, you know, you've got uh, t shirt businesses, greeting card businesses, stationery, and also promotional products. You know, that, um, you know, these are real opportunities for business ownership once they learn how to manipulate that application. Thank you. So, something, if we were able to integrate that kind of. Um, uh, Entrepreneurship mm -hmm. type education into our program, and I'd be thrilled. Uh, I don't know where to begin with that. But I'm Talk to her. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, the other aspect of it too is the whole other area of computer, you know, graphic design, which is artistic. You know, because many people are no longer just painting with acrylics and watercolor; they're creating their images right. and their prints. On, you know, through digital equipment. So, for many um, younger, perhaps I'll say, artists, you know, this is an avenue that uh, they connect to because they're so used to the technology that then they can take uh, those images and print them on a canvas and sell them in these various fairs and festivals, you know, that they have around the city. I have some personal experience. Uh, with that, because I've you know, exhibited at a number of festivals, but I've also influenced my son, who is a young artist, and he's done it already, starting at age 11. But I'm just saying, this is, you know, you can create art in a matter of, I don't know, every piece is different, you know, 30 minutes to two hours, four hours, however long it takes, but, you know, once you get a portfolio of work, you know, then you can go and help someone understand how to spell that and really turn it into a business. Yeah, and that's, that seems to be how it, it is more in, in IT, it's more that way than in other industries we work in. Healthcare and manufacturing, you apply for the job, you get the job, or you don't get the job. My friends, people I know who have IT jobs, they, they kind of they have to take more initiative, you know, and they have to educate themselves in a number of different, you know, sub-disciplines, and then they go out and fail three times, you know, um, starting up a business or whatever, and uh, they just kind of claw their way into it and find a find a niche. So, um, thinking about how to actually educate people and show them how to do that is a little intimidating. <laughs> you know, how do you how do you teach that? We can teach the, the content by teaching that that type of entrepreneurship is something that I welcome any suggestions on. Chris, do we have any other presentations? Yeah, we got one more. Okay, well, okay. Yeah, we'll up here. I wanted to welcome Pierre Clark. Hi. How are you, Pierre? How are you? Good. Um, you want to introduce yourself? Um, uh, co founder and director of Chicago Digital Access Alliance. Um, around since 2006. Um, I've done a lot of work in the technology space at Chicago, uh, neighborhood technology, neighborhood access space for a long time. Uh, more recently, um, I 
are spearheading uh, the broadband expansion effort in the city, starting in Woodmont, where we are uh, currently putting up a wireless broadband network. Uh, we have read some of that in some of the newspapers about that project. And uh, we're uh, integrating within that effort uh, digital literacy, workforce development, and all the use cases that come from having high speed broadband. So we want to make sure that the neighborhood and the city have that. So um, we are uh, on our way with our demonstration network, and uh, we plan to uh, light up two blocks. Those of you who read that paper, we are on our way with that, and we have targeted the other areas, and hopefully. Uh, will spread too much of the south side by the end of the year, and so uh, so we've been you know we've been working hard on that. But the CBAA and separately has been working in the uh, neighborhood technology space and so on the north side, uh, in Rogers Park, in um, the west side area, Bronxville, Woodlawn, South Shore, and we're also out working with the um, South Works project in. In a head which helping the residents out to find a digital literacy network that can uh, be supported through a community benefit screen which they created and which we're helping them to get implemented with uh, the developers of the uh, Southworks project. So, you know, so it's a bunch of stuff happening, but uh, just generally interested in seeing the neighborhoods connect to opportunity and the residents, you know, connect to that. So. Huge practitioner in this field, really happy to. To see you here. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Stephen and EJ from Association House. Um, hi everybody. Association House, we're located in Humble Park. We're kind of similar history to Erie House. We're one of the uh, old settlement houses. Um, our initial statements right there providing comprehensive collaborative programs in English and Spanish, promoting health, wellness, educa educational advancement, and economic empowerment. Um, here's our tech center. Uh, this is the services we have. Um, we have open access. That's like a big thing we do. Um, we're open Monday through Friday from 10 to 4. Uh, people can come in, use the computer. They can. Um, a lot of CTCs have like uh, certain rules, but they can do whatever. I mean, <laughs> certain. Well, you know, they can look at Facebook for the whole time if they want to. Et cetera, you know? uh, they can print up to 10 pages and use our scanner, um, stuff like that. And then we have tech training. We have two uh, courses right now. We have basic computer education um, in English and Spanish. I'd be very curious to like standardize those. I think that's a great idea. Um, I know a lot of CTCs have this digital literacy, and I don't know. I'm sure they're not different. That'd be a great um, thing to move towards some kind of a standardization. But, um, and then uh, we have our MS, uh, we have an office class, as I call it office technology training. So I teach Word, Excel, and then we do the Google Drive uh, cloud-based application as well. I've been kind of really pressing that because um, participants can have access to it wherever they, they are. Um, and then we have our newest um, workforce development training, and I'll let EJ talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, the customer service course. Um, Sort of an initiative that's kind of been restarted after a couple of years of hibernation, but we are excited to offer residents uh, the chance to be certified in customer service training. Um, sponsored by the National Retail Federation, uh, it's a three week course. So all applicants will pay $25, um, and upon completing the course of graduation, however you call it, they'll receive a certification. This, we feel, makes the applicants a lot more marketable. Uh, to jobs, especially local, uh, all these retail, uh, fast food, um, it's a real good thing to have. It's tangible and it's meaningful. We can thank you letters often. It says thank you for doing something that matters. So uh, the test is at the end of the course, 75 question exam. It's kind of intense, but we're studying the whole way to prepare them for. Uh, the second part of the course, uh, which starts after the break, uh, is a Kind of a hands-on job readiness training, resume resume workshops, uh, some interviewing skills, and how to search for jobs online. So there's sort of a duality to the course: um, how to learn to get your customer service certification, 
and then after that, how to learn to interview and prepare for these types of jobs. So um, we're working with a lot of job placement agencies to get people placed. Uh, it happens a lot. I think Goodwill is really good at working with us. Just looking for ways, you know, Stephen and I, to partner with those who know of people who are looking to hire masses. Or, um, lots of opportunity here, I think. I think it's good, but we just want to make the word a lot more um, well spread out, I guess. Yeah, and it's kind of the, you guys kind of touched on this, that um, our fun, people want to take computer classes, and they'll take them all day. You know. But our funders, you know, they're training, they're like, why, how is this helping people get jobs, right? So it's kind of like um, the trends we've seen is not so much we'll pay you to train these people and get computer classes, but we'll pay you, 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 we'll pay you to train these people and get them jobs. Right. So that's what we're kind of trying to move towards. Um, and also with the um, office training, you know, can we give people a certification in Microsoft or something that's, you know, kind of equitable to a lot of industries and help this person become more clear? Because people will take the courses, and I've had people take them over and over and over again. It's like they, they, they're kind of stuck there, and we want to kind of move them into a, uh, a job. And, you know. um, and then we, we do a resume workshop every Friday. And then um, employment services, I was, EJ is kind of a case manager helping the people work with our partners. And, you know, at least. Um, our current projects. Um, we're exploring the funded sources. For, like we have me, EJ, um, I have an AmeriCorps member, and that's it. So that's our tech staff. We serve we served uh, 1,900 people in financial year 13. So we we're stretched real thin. <laughs> what we do. Um, we, what I want kind of courses in development. I'd like we did have a Microsoft certification course, which was really um, it helped people in terms of their employability. I'd like to bring that back. Um, I was I went to um, Pierre, yeah, like the just the certiport, yeah, the MOS, the Microsoft Office Specials. Um, I went to a Pierre's conference and I was really inspired by um, Ramon Drummer and Team Englewood with the uh, Englewood codes and we have an alternative high school in our agency, so I wanted to kind of do like a humble park codes with the high school kids with the Espacados kids, um, and we I applied for the Deca Digital Divide to get that going. Hopefully, we'll, we'll start that. Um, 300 applications. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? And anyway, it's, a, it's, our, it's my, that's our new idea, anyway. Um, and then the, our program options and development, a lot of our, we don't have any evening or Saturday courses. That's what a lot of, the, especially the Latino community that has been asking for those offerings. Um, we don't, I don't have anybody to come in at those times. Um, I want higher classes in Spanish. We have our basic, we have our, we serve kind of half, um, half of our participants are Latino. And we, I only have basic computer for them in Spanish, and they, they want, they ask about, okay, can I take Excel in Spanish? And I don't have our staff for it. Um, and then the, uh, we're exploring kind of evening options for um, our GED. The very big barrier is childcare. So could we start a program doing digital literacy with kids or something like that while the parents are in doing their GED? Could we have the kids in the tech center doing something? It's an idea recently. Yeah. Um, our needs, sustainable funding, obviously. And then like EJ touched on, we want to build our brand with employers. So what can they expect from somebody coming out of our tech center? What skills will they have? What certifications will they have? And then again, partnerships with employers. Yeah, so we can, can we can create pathways for these folks to get employment because that's what that's what funders want to see. And we can train people all day, but that you know, I, and I can report that but it doesn't really it's not as impressive these days. Um, and then the pathways for the young programmers, you know, if we can get the, the coding um, program started, I'd like to have you know industry partners maybe talk to these kids about how do we start a career program? What do you need to know? What do you need? What should you be focusing on? Um, and then just referral uh, agreements with or relationships with you know people around the table and in the city about what are that what is everybody doing? I really like Connect Chicago, getting to know everybody, what everybody's been doing. Um, it makes my life it makes all of our lives easier if we know what's going on. Yeah. One thing I think the gentleman here, I don't get your name, we got no late. 
Greg Sutton. Great. I think you had a good question for them about the A-plus certification. What does it translate to? How can they compete? I think that's a good question. I think something they have to work on. I think, as Stephen was saying, though, pathways that can really sort of target only a few places that will accept them hands down without a lot of competition. You want to build those relationships. They can't compete, of course, with 30 years' experience in the technology field and that 20 years' experience in the technology sector. But if you build that relationship with a company that's looking just for your people, it's hard. But that's what we're doing, and I think that strategy can help. Um, you need an exclusive relationship. Some, yeah, sometimes we shoot for internships. And, um, yeah. Um, and that's often a good way to get a good Yeah. Uh, there's a we, we partner with uh, an organization uh, out in the Albert Aggression community. Uh, Ren Razor has uh, built over, I guess, a decade his own training program for CCN, CCNA. And uh, he had, he's a also a hiring manager for Telabs, but he's a tech, you know. So he's a reverend, he's a tech, he, he, you know, he passes all the tests, you know, that he teaches. And, uh, you know, he's a hiring manager now, so he you knows what they're looking for. So a lot of times you have to have that, you know, sort of specificity. And, you know, the A plus test and the county is uh, said it's rather narrow, okay. So uh, when you add to it, um, stuff that might be considered one network for the A plus test is basically computer troubleshooting, you know, box, something like that. But if you have a network component to it and um, and and uh Bill is giving that because CompTIA has a networking component that's also a certification, then that can um uh, be a help in, in you know getting people to be more you know, I know that's what he does, and so um, because a lot of employees want specific service, not necessarily you know experience, although that does play a role, but it's more what they specifically know how to do. Okay, you know they're paying somebody, so they want to know what they can specifically bring to the table when they when they start them. And it's almost like they would rather have somebody that they can train in their way. So sometimes experience doesn't help. Because you know they've got their own way of doing stuff, so employers uh, can look beyond that and say, you know, look, we want somebody who has the basic knowledge, and we know that and that's a certification. And then we can integrate that specifically into what we're doing, and that works for the person that gets hired because after six months or a year, they hire them because now they're a key member. Now they're somebody that you know knows their system, knows what they're doing. So they tend to want to keep them. So, um, and I can, you know, talk with you on here about some of that because we're very big on certification. I mean, we know that in order to uh, make money, you got to prove skills. So, you know, MCP, um, MCIGP, um, CHCCN, CCNA. So, you know, and of course CCIE, if you can hit that bar, that's relatively great. But, you know, those, those specific kinds of um, technical abilities, you know, there's not enough people that know how to do that as a skill gap. Yeah. Um, and then uh, just our infrastructure needs, like I said, we had, uh, you know, 900 day people use our machines. Um, we need, we get, I guess we, just, we need new, new hardware. Sure. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people. Um, again, the license, the Serapore license, I'd like to start certifying that with the MOS. And then just the staff. So, in terms of software, are you familiar with TechSoup? Yeah, TechSoup. We haven't gotten with TechSoup. Yeah. TechSoup no. And um, all of the universities around the uh, and they are upgrading their technology. You know, they sell it first to the university community, but then it's also available for other individuals um, who might want to buy it at a discount price. And I believe they call it, uh, uh, it's under the IT department, but it's their, uh, it's like an inventory or resale department okay. or something like that. 
I had a question about, um, can you go back? There you go. No, one more. I'm sorry. Okay. Microsoft Office and Google Drive. Can you talk about the curriculum? Yeah, so this is a curriculum that I developed. Um, basically, when we had we had a we had a training for tomorrow grant to do Microsoft certification. But I noticed all the students they could never practice at home because they didn't have um, Microsoft Office. So um, the more I used the drive, I was like, well, why aren't we just teaching them this? Said, because uh, they can come here to use the office, but they can't. Okay. Get out of emails. So that's but then I you know also if you do get a job, you probably need to use Microsoft Office. So my thought process was I think people should know both of these programs, but in the con but conceptualize it as like this is word processing. It, it works the same way in both. And what, how can I distinguish between these two? I will use them both. Um, so I set it up like kind of divided in spreadsheets. Here's the spreadsheet programs and here's word processing. And all these concepts work the same in both of these, but I want you guys to you know learn to use the basics of them. Okay. Yeah. So it's one set of curriculum yeah. that is that provides a conceptual model for approaching spreadsheet software and approaching Word software. Right. And then their final project, which I don't spend a lot of time in class, is to make a presentation. So, so you can use PowerPoint, you can use the Google presentation, but you guys have to make a five minute professional presentation. Um, what do they end up using? Usually they use PowerPoint because they like the uh, the transition yeah. uh, feature. Everybody, who doesn't? Yeah. <laughs> but um, a lot of them make it at home in the drive, and then I show them how to download it in the PowerPoint, and they come and we'll go at the transition. Okay. Um, this is huge. This is incredible. The, the, the process you just described is how long was that? So going from, hi, we teach Microsoft Office, to being a practitioner and seeing the issues with, you know, the handoff to software not existing, to creating the curriculum, to like, how long did that look like? Uh, so <coughs> when I was when I first started doing this, it was 2012, and I did the whole grant, the training for tomorrow grant, in the office format. Um, and then I was kind of after it ended, I was thinking more about, like what looked like it. Okay. There was like you know maybe two years I like, was kind of something development. It was kind of just responding to what I saw. Right. But it's the same thing that everybody else, who's every other similarly situated person, approaches. This is exactly what why we're here. It's, this is it. If we can short circuit that two year experience, yeah. a really smart person who had to stay employed, who had to be at the same place, who had to be engaged with people, who had to to do all of the work to develop the curriculum, to think about the 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 offshoots to, and again, it's a pretty sophisticated thing to then just do a conceptual thing around, you know, uh, 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 word, I'm sorry, text management, and then to uh, create the curriculum, create the processes, which is not a simple matter, right? I mean, do you guys, how do they handle transfer of doc, is there, do flash drives play any role? I just haven't thrown them. Uh, they they really like just dropping them into the drive because um, yeah they some have flash drives but then they go home and it's there yeah so that's what I'm saying because they the whole save as go click on the computer right. I can circumvent all of that because that especially for um, a new computer user that can right take a while to, to learn but I could say hey guys just you know um, drag drag and drop drop your file and save it to the desktop and throw it in there okay. and that's something that even beginners are very they can do. Um, you know, I have I explained that you need Chrome to do that, and I, I push Chrome right a lot. But, 
I push Chrome a lot. Yeah. It sounds like a. It sounds like a. Grant, no, it sounds like a grant application. Yeah. I mean that's it. Yeah. Like you go to movies, I push Chrome a lot. Who knows what they need? There's the money. But, but um, yeah, once so like the first day of class two, I have everybody get to write a Yahoo account and create a Gmail. Um, and then what about access at home? Do you have? Do most of your students have access at um, home, or do they have? have so the challenge is the the folks that have. Uh, kid in CPS, I can just, uh, tell them about the Comcast Internet Essentials. It's the $10. They actually um, up to the 25th during six months free. Um, if you guys want to promote that to your participants, yeah, if you sign up by the 25th for that program, it's six months free. I think it's that offer expects on the 25th. So, so. But the one, it's the more elderly participants that um, usually don't have it and they don't have the needs. I have to, I tell them about the universe for the twenty dollars a month, but that's pretty easy to do too much. So I'd say half have access at home. Half them have access at home. Maybe sixty percent. It's it's typically that my elderly participants that don't and they don't really have the needs. Okay. Or the ones that do not have a child in CPS. Okay. Um couple things. So then what's the uptake on Comcast Internet Essentials? When you offer it I just I have I have, they um we're 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 a grantee of Comcast. Yep. Um, they give us their whole community service division money, um, and they uh, they give me flyers and posters. Do people say, "Gosh, I love that"? Do people say that's too much? Do they? Uh, yeah, they they're really happy with it. People like that product. They like the price point. They well, yeah, it's the I mean, time, it's the cheapest you can get. And once they get it, do they say the download speeds are less than I thought it would be? Is anybody um, complain? That kind of stuff. They never had internet before, so they love. So they're blown away. Yeah. Well, yeah, they, I haven't heard any complaints. And um, I'm reminded, uh, God, that we we're actually going to run a promotion, right? We have, we we they have this opportunity cards thing, Comcast does, and we purchased some of those opportunity cards that will that. For what, 120, basically a year's yeah. worth of free service. I forgot that we did that. So the next next month we're gonna have a, a thingy cool. on that. I think giving them away. How many do we have? And you can do that as a. I mean, if you're already grantee, yeah, I negotiate with who you're working with over there. Um, I don't, I don't, it's, we work with someone from out of Baltimore. It's not, it's not a local contact. Right. Well, you might talk to folks locally and, and see if you can't as an organization. Do just what Dan was talking yeah. about, and, and then you can. The issue we've seen is that people love it when you're in front of them, then they walk away and they never take advantage of it. Yeah, because you're not closing the deal. Yeah, it, with the opportunity cards or being a, an organization that can sign up folks, then yeah. you can sign them up right there uh, and, and, and get it done. Um, uh, versus them trying to navigate through. What has got a better process, but it still has its, its roadblocks uh, in there. Um, but uh, the other thing uh, that you might consider is uh, as you move forward and you update your tech, virtualizing your desktop environment so that, again, any device anywhere, anytime, you're still getting access to whatever it is you're training. So you're not having to you know, deal with. The duplicity of whether it's Google or whether it's Microsoft, or standardized on one, they're attaching via web browser to their desktop. Yeah. Um, in, in your domain, it's backed up. You know, you can you can start applying all, all kind of the enterprise. You can manage profiles and you know, what they have access to. Yeah. Uh, and, and so forth. Okay. Freedom Pop is one. That's with everyone on .org. Yeah. Another is uh, Mobile Citizen. If they go to the Everyone On kind of search thing and they put their zip code, that's a. They will be delivered it. information yeah. from Connect Chicago. Yeah. Okay. So I would I would not use that. Okay. I just use Connect Chicago. It's the best. Uh, most updated information. Speaking of updated, I mean, all of these slides that you had, we're going to add them to your pages on Connection. Oh, cool. There's no reason why not. Right? I mean, so, trying to make that tool as important, I mean, as um, updated as possible. I really want to drill down on this Office Google thing. 
Yeah, and then you've got it in Spanish as well. Is it, is it curriculum in Spanish? I had it in Spanish for, that, for one cohort. But again, I had to use a volunteer, and he I can ask a volunteer. But you have the materials. Yeah, he made a. Um, he I can share that. He he made a Google Drive brochure in Spanish. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Okay. And um, I I don't have the course right now in Spanish. I'd I'd like to. I just don't have time. Can we go back one more slide? Talk to me about the customer service course as it relates to technology. What happened? So EJ, um, uh, he. Well, yeah, um, the, the, the course sort of runs from a, we teach out of the book uh, so that they can be prepared for the test. In terms of technology, I am finding a few applicants can't use computers too well. So to keep things in-house, as our CEO always tells us to do, utilize the resources in-house, I send them this to um, and he can give them a basic computer course. Uh, what I'm going to start to do is have a preliminary test, some way to decide if they're able to take the course. It's a simple course, but we're, we're seeing that some participants can't click on a mouse um, or they can't scroll down, and that's going to be necessary to actually click the answers for the test. So in terms of technology, there are no, uh, you know, we don't, I don't teach that part at all, but some basic skills are required, obviously, and I'm seeing there's kind of a... Oh, you mean for job mean searches and yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, we do a lot of that. I thought you meant actually teaching MOS and Google and stuff. Um, yeah, for Indeed, uh, NPO, we have students go on. I think last week they went on Target and they all applied uh, for a cashier job. So uh, it took a long time, longer than I would think. I'm kind of new to the uh, computer training world. I have a lot of patience, but they are they are uh, doing well and they submitted an application. I think if you have moderate to good computer skills, it'll take you 30 minutes or an hour to do these nowadays. They're really long applications. But for them, it took like two or three hours. But they're happy. And, you know, we do go over that. The course, especially in the job search uh, part of the course, we, we show them how to find jobs. Awesome. So it's 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 more like they, uh, they it sounds like a, you've got another part of the house that does this stuff, and you're running that part of the house, but then when their lack of digital literacy impedes their ability to complete the coursework, you work with the other part of the house. No, we, when we got this, we got this funding uh, for the customer service, and um, I was kind of suggesting it be put into the tech center because if you don't know how to use the computer, you can't you know, really actively do a depth job search. So I said, I think this class should take place in a computer lab. I think um, half the course should be like what he was saying, you know, tech-based stuff. Like, you have a resume. If there's a couple of pieces of paper in your pocket, we got to put that in you know, digital form. We have to, you have to know how to go to any that kind of search for jobs. You have to know how to do this stuff. Because if you, you don't, then you're not going to get very far. So, yeah, that's why we, we place uh, workforce development in the technology department, because it's so interesting. And I don't know if this was discussed before I got here. Has anybody talked about sharing training personnel? Um, because everybody has a shortage and a need. Um, but oftentimes, um, your existing personnel aren't booked you know, for the full complement because you don't have the class or you don't, you know, or sometimes you have to hire part time people. Um, we were taking a look at trying to do that um, with about eight. CTCs that were sort of nearby each other. Okay. But we didn't get the funding to get that off the ground. But sometimes that works out pretty naturally. Um, where you can either trade services, where it's, it's no cost to both, but you both have more capacity. Or, you know, it's much cheaper to buy two hours a week on a consultant line item than it is to hire a full time person. You don't have a full time equivalent yet. Um, a need, need as of yet. Um, and we have a lot of talent amongst the agencies, like, like a ton of talent. Um, so some sort of way, um, and he'll figure out a way to put this on the Connection Pilot site, as I said, to share, you know, to do some talent sharing, to swap it. You know, yeah. like, like we have a real need to have an after-hours Spanish version of this course. Yeah. 
you know, does someone else have a, a trainer that we can swap borrow? Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, <clears throat> I think that that's that's ideal. Um, I guess the the, can, the the model I'm thinking of is the propagation of the materials. Just like this Educación Popular, the idea is right. to grow more people, mm -hmm. not to share existing people, because there will never be enough. Mm -hmm. But the more you grow, and the more you grow everywhere, nobody has to share anybody. Everybody, the, the best way to do this work is to do it right next door, to do it with the person you love, to do it with your cousin, to do it, you know. So the more people we grow, and the wider we grow the base, the less we have to worry about Sharing staff and resources. I don't know about that. I don't know if that's right. Well, I mean, there's stages, though. I mean, we're, you know, part part of that cross pollination is going to be the sharing of the folks. Because then you see that person teaching. You know, I mean, in order to really own the education populaire, you're going to have to see it. You know, you can't just send it in a file. Yeah, that's true. You know what I mean? It's going to have to be. You know, you attend a class. We do train the trainer. In order to build this capacity, it's it's, it's going to have to, it's going to look a little bit different than just okay, there it is, drive down, and then you know, I mean, it's just like you can't do any other kind of education that way. This education is also a little more complex um, when you're dealing with adult learners of varying education backgrounds. So I'm not to saying that that part of the strategy is not worthwhile. I'm just saying that there's a stage that we're in where we're trying to build yep. capacity. That makes sense. Where the these other yeah, uh, seeding strategies, mm -hmm. we need yep. to do X number of years of seeding strategies in this region, this region, this region. Yep. And one of those might be sharing. Well, yeah, we're uh, in our workforce department. We're trying to do that right now. Although um, the manufacturing instructor, um, because we can only afford part-time instructors. A lot of other organizations also. So if you just hire one person, they can be part time in several organizations. That will actually become a living link between your organizations, mm -hmm. which is something we yeah. are always talking about doing anyway. And it never, it never seems to really happen with organizations collaborating intensively. So, yeah. Are there any other areas that that happens in your organization? Uh, you know, like, is there, there, there a model you can build off of? So, is there in I don't know, a different discipline area, like child care or whatever. Is there another model you can use to kind of translate that into technology where you do share an individual cross organization? Well, yeah, I think it, yeah, it seems to depend on the individual. Um, you know, sometimes um, uh, someone uh, just, yeah, I can only tie it to my own experience, which, which is in manufacturing, but um, uh, for the the CNC instructors, the ones that uh, teach how to use uh, the computerized machinery, um, which is what we train for, there's very few of them. There's very few people out there that have that skill. And the very few that are out there, they're working in all the organizations. They're working, you know, there's, yeah, I know I work in, yeah, they're like, you know, they're, and they're always being pulled back and forth, swapped between different community colleges and training organizations. And it's really something to see these organizations fighting over these few qualified instructors. Um, now that doesn't really happen at, uh, in our tech classes or at, in our bridge level because those, you know, qualifications for those instructors are not necessarily they're not as rare. So, but it would still be ideal. I, I just I can't say I know how to get that started. Anything else? Association. Did anybody else have a presentation? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Dan, I did that um, to bring um, flash drive with, with slides. I did want to talk about two events that the Chicago Land Chamber is going to have, and both are on the ChicagolandChamber.org uh, uh, website. Uh, I did bring a hard copy of handouts. <coughs> Okay. And um, I uh, approached collaboration from my Chamber of, of Commerce um, point of view and um, thought about the collaboration of, 
a business community-based organization and the um, public uh, sector. And um, really, there's there aren't any dividing lines. Um, that they um, they totally intersect. And if you think back to the slide that Tech Services showed about opportunities for collaboration. Business, especially the small business and entrepreneurs, are struggling with a lot of the, the same types of, of issues. And they've got the spaghetti wiring too. <laughs> you, you count up. And glad to see small business here that's helping some of the, the nonprofits. Um, anyway, so on April 2nd, the uh, Chicago Land Chamber is hosting the exchange and I want to draw your attention to the keynote which is just 90 minutes at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon right over here at the Hyatt. Okay, if I could point through that building, it's at the, the Hyatt Regency. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, kick it off with Shark Tank's uh, Damon John and so he'll be talking about uh, his experience as an entrepreneur who's now a multimillionaire, and then several others. The, the title of it is Fueling Business Growth, but um, if I had been writing the title, I would have said Technology, Fueling Business Growth, and you'll see the, the um, other presenters <clears throat> are um, about um, how technology is so important to the um, growing business. And I, I think some of the, the issues and opportunities that are going to um, surface in those 90 minutes are perhaps at a different level than what you're dealing with, but you'll relate to all of them and hopefully be able to take something back to your organization. And it's free. Okay, you, just, you do have to, to uh, sign up in, in advance. And, um, Microsoft, Boston Consulting, um, Shark, and, and Comcast. This says it's $35. Excuse me? This says it's $35. Okay. That is if you want to go to the, the networking event later in the day. That's for the, um, the 4.30 oh, to 7.30. Yeah. The, um, the keynote yeah. with Shark Tank yeah, is free and at, at uh, uh, 2 o'clock. And then um, another one that I uh, wanted to share is on April 25th, um, again, this is free, um, it's two hours, 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock in the morning, and that's going to be at the America Club, right over there in the, the Aeon um, Center. Um, and the, the title of the event is Magnetic Cultures in Thriving Work Environments. And what we're doing is bringing in um, uh, the author of Building a Magnetic Culture, who will give some, some tips on um, how to build and maintain a magnetic culture that uh, creates that employee engagement. Just as you were talking um, earlier about the, the customer engagement and the development of those, those soft skills. And then we're going to have um, a panel discussion with what we refer to as panelists of top performers. Those people that are the, the high energy, always up, positive um, people. And they're going to talk about how their environment sustains that. Um, and we've embedded this with exhibits from behavioral health and employee assistance programs. Now, where did this bright idea come from? <laughs> okay, this is going to be a two-hour, fairly lively event, and it's supposed to be motivational, inspirational. It's not, you know, a, a deep learning experience. Um, our uh, uh, workforce and, and workplace leadership were talking about the um, reemployment of the long-term unemployed. 
And we were saying, okay, so there are initiatives to get more opportunities opened up for the long-term unemployed. Think about the people that became part of the long-term unemployed. They were most likely not with um, a growth enterprise that had a thriving environment and a great culture. We're all going to hopefully contribute in some way to their reskilling, upskilling, even career change. We're going to put them in environments that most likely are very fast paced um, growth environments and hopefully they're thriving environments. We need to have more people understand that this doesn't happen automatically. That people need to be nurtured into being part of this kind of a magnetic culture. And so this is one small step toward um, that uh, cultural awareness in the workplace. So if, um, April 2nd, April 25th, and both of these are on the um, chicagolandchamber.org uh, website in our uh, calendar of events. And um, anyone who has any problems signing up for either of them to register online, which is one of our tech problems, <laughs> it's not that user friendly, um, you always call or email me. And um, my colleague, uh, Greg Stevens, phone and email is on the exchange. Well, you can also contact him. Any questions? Comments? Anything else? We, uh, we have six minutes of our time together. Everybody has been um, eat approximately on the four, four and a half sandwiches uh, <laughs> before, uh, before we leave. So we can just get to work on that. Well, what, With you. <laughs> one of the things that yeah, one of the things I think about, several of, you, of us talked about the, the digital divide grant you know, as in the past an, an annual event uh, folks to put their application together and be one of 300 uh, applications, but um, you never know when you're you're going to be able to influence how that process can uh, uh, change for the future. And you never know if it's going to be a uh, by task force member sitting at a table or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> never know. You never know. All right. But uh, I, think, you know, I think collaboration around how to approach that and really secure um, uh, funding to to um, go you know really meet the goals of, of uh, you know what the task force is, is looking to do with the, the funding as as well as uh, impact the various things that, whether it's new technology or or new uh, uh, programs that are developed and and how it's being shared amongst ourselves here it, there, there's a good probability going together after larger chunks of, of that funding uh, can have a much bigger impact than all of us individually going out and trying to get 75 but they negotiate down to 60,000 or 40,000 or whatever and, and now you don't get anything that, that you expected out of it. And I'm just I'm uh, oversimplifying the process but uh, I, uh, I think um, in the year before hopefully if it's still in the, the budget for next year uh, it would be interesting to collaborate on how to approach um, that funding stream and, and look at uh, providing a more coordinated approach across the area or the region uh, here to uh, access more of the funding that, that benefits all of us jointly together and the Gestalt theory right? yeah. um, uh, there as opposed to again us all competing for a pot of money that, that only a small group of us are, are going to get. Uh, to that point Greg, um, one of the other things that I think would be interesting to do, and I'm starting to see this more and more in my work with PCI, is we're not aligning 
the digital divide funds and the broadband investment funds in a way that they could be aligned. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, all, it's lines on the application, <laughs> but it's really not aligned. Right. That's, it's just filling in a line. So there, there's opportunity for, you know, looking at the infrastructure that you need for, to bridge the digital divide. You know, that being the technology infrastructure and all the other sort of pieces and actors you know, sort of need, the partners you need in the community to help do that and what those ingredients are. And, and there's an opportunity to align sort of economic development strategies, the broadband infrastructure strategies, the digital divide strategies, because they're all getting to the same sort of access issues. So, um, so there's probably other people we could invite to this table to talk about the pieces of those. Um, and I also just got appointed to the limited digital divide. You so never we have know. Two we have two at the table, right? Are fairly <laughs> opinionated and are not going to sit on their hands. Um, so, um, but 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 we, you know. But we keep, we, that's why this is so important, because we need to figure out you know, those alignments. And we see them locally, and we have to take that story up so that the folks up here can align and, and make sense for what we're trying to do at the press report. Yeah. So yeah, so this is the Eliminate the Digital Divide, the Digital Divide Elimination Advisory Committee. And uh, just a page on the Illinois website, and as you can see, Laura is a member. Uh, I am a member. Um, in our last meeting, I was elected chair of this group. One of the great things about this group is that there's no power, which is awesome. <laughs> um, I, I love being members of groups that have no power um, because then you don't have to worry about anything. Um, we have absolutely, as you can see from the function, uh, it advises the department itself. It is the department itself which awards the grants in establishing criteria and procedures for identifying recipients of grants. So we have absolutely no role whatsoever in deciding where the grant fund dollars get spent, and I think that's entirely appropriate, and I think that's great. What it allows us to do is to do the uh, harder, frankly, and more important work of what we just did over the last two hours here in Chicago and have to spread it across the entire state. Of creating a culture of shared learning. And we just have, I don't know, 10 examples of, uh, of things that, that can and will be shared because there's, you know, the culture exists here. And um, we are interested in creating it, propagating it throughout the state, and um, being a real uh, leader, and we already are. We're a leader in part because of the long attention that the city of Chicago is focused on on this in part because of the amazing work of, of Pierre and Laura and others and Greg and people have been at this for a very long time. So uh, we have a really great opportunity to, to to really drill down into this to this culture because that's what matters. That the money is is nice, um, but as we know, the average grant is what forty two thousand dollars a year. That ma that matters a lot. That's real money. Um, in my world, where I come from, when you give people the keys to technology, that is an extraordinarily valuable service in and of itself that's worth money. So I think that there can be a market for these services that go well beyond asking the state of Illinois for anything, asking for foundations in Chicago for anything. It doesn't make any sense. What makes sense to me is we're in the technology industry. I, last time I looked at technology industry, it was worth about a trillion dollars. So we're here. We are a part of it, and 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 we have the power to to uh, propagate that and to improve lives. With technology. Um, is there anything else from any other uh, any others? If not, we'll end our meeting in the in the fashion with which we've grown accustomed with with the song. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs>